Hello, beautiful light-filled souls. I am so happy to talk with another near-death experiencer in this episode. So Jim Bruton, I met him at the IANS conference and heard his story and his presentation was fascinating. He's been interviewed a lot recently, so I'll post some of those links below as well. But I am really looking forward to this conversation and it's rare for a near-death experiencer who has only had one three years ago to have integrated it so fully, but I I attribute that to your spiritual experiences, your background, your knowledge of the world, and, and maybe even the experience itself, but uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Trish. It's nice to be with you and your audience and listeners tonight. Thank you. Yeah, so the first question that I have for you before we get into your dramatic uh, accident and near-death experience is... You're three years and a few months in, how are you different before and after this experience? That's a great question. And what's interesting is that uh, some people will say, gosh, you seem so self-absorbed. Well, I've said, you know, once you have a near-death experience, it's almost as if you should generate an entirely new horoscope from that day forward. You have a new birthday now. You are now a new person. Your values have changed down to your core. And you realize it first silently uh, because as you go through life and things happen you know, that need a reaction or a thought or a deed, you, you realize how differently you do see things now. And react. I mean, sometimes things that would have shaken you to your core, you just kind of look, shrug, and you deal with it. But you deal with it in a very different way. So I'm quick, I have to jump in right there because I know a little bit of your background, but you've been in very dangerous situations. Did you fear death before then? Or do you fear it less? Like, what's your perspective right. on death? Um, you know, I, I think I made my peace with death a long time ago anyway, but I did, but not, let me put it this way. My core belief is this, that before my near-death experience, as interested in spirituality as I was, and, and like you say, being in all kinds of crazy and dangerous places all over the world, whatever belief I had was belief. Now, it's woven into the fabric of my being. There's so much that I don't need to go back to and refer to some mystical book to quote something. It really just comes out of me naturally and in my own words. And I've seen this with so many others too. You know, when we were at that IANS conference, it was the same thing. It was just amazing how it really becomes part of you. It's a knowing, so many of us say, that if it's different from faith, it's this <laughs> deep, integral knowing. Does that resonate with you? Absolutely. Even to the point that it sounds funny to say it until you explain it. And that's, I don't pray anymore. Because how many prayers do we hear out there that are all about, please save me from some bad decision I made. Like, you know, don't let me get fired. Don't let my wife catch me or you know, something like this, something crazy. But uh, once, once you've seen how things work, how, how God's plan just weaves things together and how, it's all, basically there's like almost no wrong decision you can make. You just may take the scenic route instead of a more direct route, but you'll get there. Um, and, and so, like I said, uh, one other time that if you were to say to God, Hey, I want to be the head of the mafia. I like the cars, the women, the money, the power. You'd say, well, go see how that works out for you. You know, you can't row in two boats at once. And when you're done, I'll still be here. And, you know, we would all go and see how that works out for us. Probably not very well. But uh, anyway, it's, it's like you say, you move from faith to knowledge. And for me, that's represented by the only thing that I would pray for is that my will is one with God. So, yeah, the fear of death, it comes up for a lot of us. And I know that, you know, you've been, you can go into this if you want a little bit. You've been in some situations that were incredibly dangerous. and. I know you made peace with death, but how is it different now, you know, the thought of, of death? Sure. Well, before, I mean, one of the big climaxes was uh, I, I, was in, I, I was an embedded journalist for NBC News in Iraq with the Marines, and we were in firefights, and, you know, we were in a lot of uh, firefights. And I also did quiet work for the military and the government. And 
one time we were in a really nasty firefight uh, as we were still invading Baghdad. And I remember we only had cover on two sides or being hammered from five, but I just felt really peaceful and kind of one with the universe type peaceful. And I talked to a friend, a Buddhist friend afterwards. I said, you know, by all rights, I should have been scared to death, but instead it was absolutely the opposite. It's not because I'm some macho guy, you know, talking about the story at the bar. And I said, I wonder why that was so. And he goes, I know why. I go, why? He goes, because in that moment, everything is true. And I thought, that is perfect. Because what he's saying is that in that intensity, you become that present. And when you're that present, there's this peace. There's this feeling that, as weird as it sounds, everything's going to work out all right. Now, that may not mean you're going to survive, but everything is as it should be. And you have that gut level awareness. Now, I don't need a war zone to come to that realization. I carry that around with me every waking moment. Yeah, I I do understand that total peace with death. I don't like suffering and I don't like pain. I don't even like hearing about people's crashes and you know the the intensity of that because I go back to my own crash. That's one of the downfalls of near death experiencers interviewing each other. Uh, and also another downfall is like you get two of us together, technology may break down. <laughs> but um, but yeah, let's go ahead and jump into what happened and explain a little bit about the plane that you designed and, and your crash briefly, and then we'll get to the experience. Sounds good. I wanted to add one footnote to something you just said that it's interesting, you know, when, when those of us who uh, been blessed to have a near-death experience when it comes as a result of say a really bad accident of some sort whether a car crash or maybe even a disease or some hospital event or drowning or whatever it's amazing how that event that delivered us to the NDE while in and of itself would be a hell of a story in of its own self it becomes a footnote when you're talking about the NDE like Oh yeah, that's right. I had that really bad crash, but let me get to the good part. And everybody's going, wait, wait, but it's just so funny. It's almost like a real indicator that somebody did have something profound happen to them. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Most of the time when people go through that, they, they go through all of the hospital stuff, but with every near death experience, I'm like, take me to the other side. I can't wait to get there. <laughs> right. Exactly. So what happened was, uh, once I retired from the war zone, I, um, I'd always loved really old airplanes, like from World War I, even pre-World War I. So uh, my brand new wife, uh, the reason I left the war zone, uh, said, you know, now that you're not traveling, why don't you build that plane you're always talking about? And I said, you know, you're right. And so I did. It was a reproduction 1917 Fokker triplane, just like the Red Baron flew, but I came up with my own paint scheme of black and white stripes. and built it very faithfully to the original design. And then I flew it for about 10 hours and sold it to an Air Force pilot. <clears throat> and then I thought, well, I want to build another plane. This plane was a lot smaller, very whimsical in design. Looks like something out of a Disney cartoon called a flying fleet because it's that small. Imagine a soapbox derby car uh, with a, a wing above your head and a wing right behind your head and then a BMW motorcycle engine right in front of you, face, right? So I first flew it in um, early October, it was the 3rd of 2016, and on my first test flight, I really didn't like the way it handled. So I thought, well, I'm going to sort of sleep on it a couple of days, go back out and uh, master its quirks. So I went back out on October 6th, 2016, and somewhere in all this test flying, I lost my engine. I remember seeing it stop. And luckily, I don't panic, so I just worked on getting it going, but I was losing altitude quickly, realized I couldn't make it back to the uh, grass field that wasn't very far away. So the only, the only remaining option was to target a uh, very small lake at a nearby Boy Scout camp. It was the only place with no hills, no trees, no rocks. And I thought, well, you know, I'll just try to get it in as close to the bank as I can. Well, I overshot the bank. <laughs> so now... We have this uh, reality of hitting all these big tree trunks in a soapbox derby <laughs> car at about 70 miles an hour. So yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was tough. And um, I broke all my ribs, ruptured both lungs, my right leg had multiple fractures, had a hole in my lower back due to a battery, big battery breaking loose and hitting me. Um, 
other than that, I was fine. But it was um, it was definitely bad. Luckily for me, uh, there was a man fishing in this camp. It, it, the camp was closed, so he could go down there and fish occasionally and be left alone. He also usually did not have his cell phone on him. It was in his truck half a mile away. On this day, thank heavens, he had his cell phone. He saw everything. And he was also a retired police officer. So you know, he was used to seeing trauma. He wasn't going to freak out and by virtue of that, maybe cause you to die sooner. So he rushed over. He propped me up. He called 911. They flew a helicopter in and he kept me propped up so that I could try and breathe. And uh, anyway, the helicopter landed. They extracted me and took me up to Hartford, uh, Connecticut, Hartford's uh, trauma center. And I cannot say enough good about that that bunch of people. They are amazing up there. They run it like a military operation and they took great care of me. Anyway, um, when my wife finally got there a couple hours later, uh, they she saw me in a breathing machine with all of these tubes going in and coming out of me. Uh, and I was, of course, very delirious. And I have no memory of this time, to be honest. Uh, but I was getting out of the restraints and I was being a bit of a handful. And they, they told my wife, um, we have so many day-long operations coming up and we could lose him at any time we should just put him in a coma so she agreed and they did and it's basically it's when they put me in a coma here that i woke up in in the in between which i have a picture on the wall behind me that sort of gothic landscape uh is where i it was like teleportion teleportation when what was your first feeling as soon as you were there you know i was excited as soon because i didn't believe that we went on this doesn't look like anything from biblical readings this doesn't look like it would fit in with christianity and you know things that you've known through spirituality <laughs> what was your first thought uh well it's interesting For, first of all there wasn't any surprise. It was like, you just accept what's there. Like, this is where I am. Okay, what do I do now? The first feeling I have was nausea. I had a wave of nausea go through me. And uh, it was like, it, it kind of makes you double over. And I looked up and I saw what looked like a, imagine if New York had a nuclear explosion. And this is several thousand years after that. And no one has come into that city what remains of it since then. It looked kind of like that. It was just a big wasteland. And the the clouds were heavy above me, as you can see in that photo. Um, and there was just this feeling that something is about to happen. That that I remember feeling. And I but I remember just looking around and I, you know, that wave of nausea hit me and I, I spoke out loud only twice there right then and just before i left and right then i said i don't think i can stand this and the minute i said that i heard this noise of like the light clacking of gears over to my left and i looked over and i saw this lattice like a sculpture of lattice shaped like an egg maybe four stories high about 40 or 50 feet high off to my left and i just knew that thing and i are somehow connected in the, the clacking of gears, I, I, as I hobbled over to it, you know, like holding my stomach, I could see that these little sector gears were, were in there and they were moving around and, and they were passing through each other. Some were definite and you could see them clearly as some were more, uh, less definite, more ghost-like. But each time I looked at one of these gears, it's as if a video feed played in my head of what that gear represented. And... I looked at it and that's when I said, what, where am I? And this voice didn't see anyone. So it was like a, you could say it was a disembodied voice, but it was obviously t telepathic. Um, said, you are in the in-between. And I said, you know, in between what? And it said everything. Um, basically you're, you're in the impossible now. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And it said, it's impossible in its short duration yet. Here you are standing inside the eternity of a single moment. And it said, do you remember the world to which your body belongs? And I definitely remember trying to remember, and I had no idea. If someone had come up and said, if you stay here any longer, you can't go back, I would have said, go back where? To your family. What family? What is family? 
it was just I was just aware of being this conscious being. And when I said I have no idea, it, it said, then you see the truth and now the past is dust. And I said, well, you know, why why would I touch some of these gears? Because I reached inside to see, well, you know, are they ghost-like or can I put my hand through them or can I touch them? And it said that um that all the choices when i said why do some of these gears hurt I said you know all, all choices have unintended consequences some unfortunate and some not that the pain each brings is your guide and, and one time i said you know where are the gears that feel good and said you know you're not here to feel good I have a uh, question yeah because pain to you pain to others pain to everyone so like if someone is using this wisdom to guide their own lives and their own choices, because I do believe these metaphors from near-death experiences guide people. And if someone takes that message, did you get the sense it was like a choice that hurt other people? Yeah, it was different. I look at it this way. Notice that I, I haven't talked about going through a tunnel or seeing yeah. deceased loved ones or having, let's say, a life review but I would say having a life review in the way we usually hear about it. To me, being presented with these, these gears being choices in my future, well, what is the future but the fruit of the past? What is a life review but to review how you've lived your life thus far so you can make an in-flight course correction to better get you where you're supposed to go, to better be the person you're supposed to be. And to me, that was highly symbolic of, of where I was and what I was doing and, and the God-given opportunity I had to, let's say, clean up my future. So the whole purpose here, and the other subtle thing here is that when I was feeling around inside the egg for these gears and you know would find one that hurt, usually it was kind of high up, which I think represented the future. Level would have been now, maybe down was, you know, past, or like I said, it turns to dust. But what that was saying was I, I wasn't able to use a, a moral compass to make these choices that I was literally going by feel and if it caused pain it was bad and I thought about it later I thought well imagine if one of those gears that made me feel bad was winning the lottery and I'd be set for life but what if that was going to make me a really bad person through the choices and the opportunities that wealth would have given me I mean, so many of us could say, well, you know, let me keep that gear in here, but I'll promise I'll be good. But this is like saying, you know, let's just don't take the chance. <laughs> you know, let's just remove it because you know it's going to cause you pain. So, so it's, okay. it's, it's fascinating. It's intuitive, but you also have the visuals that go with it to a degree. And it sounds like it didn't give you enough time to think about it in a rational way, that it was just like, this It doesn't feel right, get rid of it. You hit on an incredibly subtle point that I've realized about my own life. So many times when I'm presented with a, a choice or an opportunity that I'm pretty sure is coming from the great beyond, I'm not given much time to think about it at all. It's like if you have too much time, you're going to mess it up. You know, you, you got to pack your bags and go now. You have to uh, go brush your teeth and run out the door now. You know, because like I said, you, sometimes if we think too long about something, we'll find reasons not to do the right thing or will overcomplicate it. So it's funny you mentioned that because I do think that in this case it was totally true. Um, and, and so what I would do is, you know, I'd reach around, <clears throat> find a gear that caused me pain and I would sort of work it out of the lattice and throw it out, throw it away. And literally the machine would start spinning around again. And I said, what's going on? It says your future has to reset itself around uh, possibilities that now are not meant to be. You can't create a vacuum and like walk into a boardroom in 20 years and a gaping black hole is in space. It's like trying to make a hole in water. It's going to fill in as your hand moves through it. It's the same thing. And, and I was told that, I said, well, I said, I don't even know where or when these futures happen. I said, that's not important. What's more important is that you basically watch what I'm showing you. Watch the beauty of how things fit and refit together. And I realize now that this was, allegorical to saying, I'm going to show you how the universe works. I use an analogy. 
imagine 10 people go to Disney World and imagine five of them want to go on every ride there and five guides show up and they're ready to take them on every ride answer any question they have i mean really help bring it to life for them and they're going to have a great time imagine the other five are saying um we want to really kind of go behind the scenes and see how things work and to just use perhaps the most recognizable ride at disney world it's a small world the one we all kind of laugh about now um those five people who want to experience it from the touristic side could be on the side of the ride in which they see the little figures singing and dancing and waving their arms around and smiling the other five i mentioned are behind that ride seeing the valves the gears the circuits and they're watching it and as they watch it they may intuit you know what that gear is going to wear out soon we should replace it and fix it and make things run better now both populations both sample sizes are experiencing the same ride but from two totally different ways one in terms of the content of you know, is it a chinese character is it an african character and the other from the process of how things work that is what we're talking about here. and i believe that near-death experiences meet us where we need to be met is that does that resonate with you are you a process person did this I'm make very process. yeah i'm totally process i mean i'd even come out of a party one time saying i cannot remember that person's name but i know it was consonant vowel consonant consonant like bill <laughs> you know i mean i don't know why it just gets so process oriented that it kind of uh, you know get a little odd about it maybe but that's i mean that that really does talk about how in understanding the process you can understand the underlying formulas of things and where that further took shape here and in the conversation in my understanding of why i was in what i call the in between and what i was doing um i was told you know eliminating these bad choices of removing these gears it doesn't mean you won't make wrong ones we can still make mistakes but the intention now is what's getting cleaned up and i think you know if we talk about what creates karma a lot of it is about intention I mean, you could you you could do two different you could do two actions that identically look alike but your intention can create good karma or it can create bad karma based on that and i remember um saying you know I, I don't know how comforting that is and it said you know eliminating bad choices doesn't mean you won't make wrong ones uh, but you won't know they're wrong until after they pass and that right and wrong are variables you have no control over and that's why it's better to just study and observe and intuit and make it part of you this understanding of how things work and fit and refit together and i did it i'm sorry go ahead Oh, um, no. Did you feel that when you were cleaning up these places that uh, it was, in a sense, changing you in a way, the way you looked at the world, the, the way that you operate in the world? Not right away. What I was aware of was I was becoming less nauseous. Makes sense, right? I'm removing these things that, you know, have this definite repercussion on me. And I'm basically feeling the pain of potentially bad actions so that i can measure yeah they need to go um so that's pretty much what i was focused on right then and as soon as as soon as i pulled out a gear everything started spinning around again and it was just over and over and over for this week or it was a week here but like I say it was like a split second there maybe um and i asked you know i said what you know what am i missing here in my lack of understanding of all this and it said what is clearly before you grace no one deserves salvation it can only be given by grace uh, that it's your birthright but it must be chosen at the expense of the world that separates us and i said you know that again when i was saying that i didn't know where any of this was going to occur in my life and i was told it really doesn't matter what's important is that you use this time to clean up your future it said that removing your enthusiasm to further chain yourself to the world isn't as painful as carrying the crushing weight of those chains once they're forged around you and i said you know it's like this place was designed 
in a way that I can't screw it up. I can do one thing and one thing only, and this is it. And literally, the in-between said to me, probably the most profound thing that's ever been said to me. It said, if those with choices make poor use of them, then offering fewer possibilities could be called mercy. And in a way, that's like, that grace is almost like that unconditional love so many of us talk about. You know, you're met with a, a grace that it is hard to wrap one's mind around, you know, that something is there for your benefit, basically, you know, to love you and to make you better. I mean, like, I mean, that's a lot of near-death experiencers say that no matter what their experience is, they know that they are better for it. It's true. And, you know, let, let's face it, you know, they say a word to the wise and a two by four for the wicked. Well, you know, I guess I need the two by four, right? Uh, but I figure, you know, if God's swinging it, it's a relationship. I'm good. <laughs> and I'm grateful as well. So I have no, pro I have no problem with it. The, um, I remember, though, it, at some point, it, it, it did say, clearly it said, um, you know, as you go back, um, pay more attention to your relationships and everything is interconnected. I remember so clearly those words too. And um, it said, you know, you can't change the past, but you can make better choices in the future. And it said to be gentle with everyone as I'm gentle with you. And I said, what's gentle about all this? And it said, well, you prayed for something for which being here is an answer. And now the man who fell from the sky is not the same who flew into it. And I literally said, I think I can live with this now. And to my best understanding, that's when I woke up back here. Wow. So there's a lot of deep wisdom, and it's probably going to take years, maybe the rest of your life to unpack all that, you know, because it will apply to your life situations going forward in numerous ways. And couldn't agree more. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, it's, it's deeply profound. You know, what's interesting, too, is, you know, as you, as you go in and, and read, you know, in comparative religion, you, wherever you go to find meaning, whether it's, you know, in quantum physics or, you know, the Tao Te Ching or something like that, um, it's interesting how some of the greatest truths are said with a hint of ambiguity. And I think it's designed that way because it makes you stretch, makes you reach. It's like as we were originally hunter-gatherers, it's like we're hunter-gatherers on the spiritual sense as well, to, to discover. In other words, if all of these great truths were simply given to us, they'd be worth what they cost. Nothing. But when they, do, you know, a near-death experience, you can say that's the price of payment, and it's a steep price. I am very happy that we can use a broader term, spiritually transformative experience, of which an NDE can be part, but it doesn't mean you have to necessarily go through that to have this incredible transformative experience that you, know, you can bring to the party and, and make life for yourself and many other people so much better. Um, so that's, uh, you're right though. I, I, think, I think the integration phase that they say, what, seven to 10 years, it's lifelong. And, and honestly, it was interesting when we were at this uh, conference, uh, the IANS conference over Labor Day, <clears throat> I've never been to a conference where as you walk up to a conference room and it's emptying out of the uh, previous attendees, you're all looking at each other and you're all strangers, yet there's this hint of recognition in each other's eyes. And next thing you know, the couches are all full in the lobby of the convention center. People who've never met before are suddenly talking as if they're long lost friends, sharing intimate details of their lives. And if you listen, it really is about continuing to work through that integration, whether it's in their relationships uh, at home, or the relationships at work or wherever, uh, or the relationships with God. I mean, it's a continual unfolding. It's a continual exploration because every day is a new surprise. And, you know, some, and it's amazing how many times it's guided by synchronicities, which seem to become more of a norm than an exception after a spiritually transformative experience. Yes, and it's like you start a conversation mid-conversation. You just walk up to someone, you're like, oh, <laughs> you, you talk to the spirits too, and then you're off. <laughs> you know, like, and, and, and whatever it is, it's almost as if it's been ongoing for some time. 
It's so true. I mean, you can almost finish each other's sentences. And here's the other interesting thing to me is that um, while we do have a lot of near-death experiences that have similar hallmarks, again, like the tunnel of seeing deceased who are loved ones, you know, our grandmother, grandfather, whoever, dog even, uh, to see or meet angelic or what we perceive to be holy beings, and then the, the life review, um, it's interesting how there's still enough individuation uh, with each person's experience that if you had an NDE, you could listen to what sound like very different experiences, but you can still feel that common thread and, and you might even voice, you might vocalize saying, oh yeah, I, I, I totally get that. It's the same as this one. Someone who hasn't had the experience would say, no, that sounds kind of different, but you, we can feel that same thread. And to, uh, in response to something you said earlier, for me, I sum it up as here in life, we see life through the filters we want. You know, we look in the mirror every morning and say, you know, best good looking person ever. I can go out and tackle the world and win and, you know, I'm perfect. <laughs> but on the other side, we see life through the filters we need. And so, and you will hear people talk about how incredibly tailored the experience seemed to be to them. Like they will see very small, subtle things, symbols, if you will, that, um, are very, very personal to them, and only someone like God <laughs> could have known to put that in there, and because of the meaning they attribute to it. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and as I was listening to your experience, you know, it's very different from mine. Um, mine, I feel like, is at times the classic one, you know, in that sense that I saw ancestors, I had the tunnel, I met angel, you know, like all of those classic moments, but what did I learn? I learned not to judge others. I learned that we're all connected. I learned, you know, that love for others is a very high quality of frequency and that, you know, when you're in that frequency, then everything flows smooth, smoother. And so I learned to make different choices and choices that were based on love, not on pain, not on, oh, me, 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 me. Oh, I'm in so much pain. Oh, my life is so terrible. I don't care what I do to other people. Not that type of attitude you know, but more an attitude of what am I generating in this world? How do my actions affect other people? How can I give more grace to others because their lives are long? And so you know, those, those same awarenesses came out of two very different experiences. Absolutely. We, we were being spoken to in a language we would readily understand. And I mean, maybe this says something very disparaging about my character that I needed to be spoken to in that way. But you know what? I'm just glad he didn't want to take the chance. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, if he, if he goes on this side of Disney World, he's just going to be on the rides forever. And he's not going to get the point of why he's here. So that's fine. And I have, uh, I have no objection to, to the experience at all. I'm very grateful for it. In fact, I really am. And it's interesting. And in, in you know, as I sort of was coming to in the hospital, I do like to say it's interesting that I, I had to go back and find an email before my crash that I remembered either reading or sending. It was two days before my crash. So it's from, from basically I have no memory at all from two days before my crash, obviously in the hospital at the beginning part with the coma. And then I'm estimating approximately a week after I came out of the coma. So you have these two bookends in time, if you will, of amnesia, you know, soon physical shock and anesthesia and, you know, drug re uh, pain reducing meds. But between those two, you have this amazing uh, clarity, um, cognitive ability, maybe, you know, transcendent thought, I don't know, but certainly a transcendent experience, but to be able to remember it in such detail, and I find that interesting. But as I came to in the hospital, it was interesting. Um, it was as if I had one of these video feeds playing over and over in my head of this experience. I mean, it was totally self-contained, and it just kept playing over and over in my head, and I remember just thinking, what is this? I had no idea. I had no idea this was a near-death experience. I just knew, wow, what is going on here? I did, I think I knew it was at least an out-of-body experience, but I didn't have all the terminology down pat at that time. And the first person I talked to was my nurse in the morning. She was a great nurse. Her name was Jen. 
And I noticed a lot of times she was just hanging out because we enjoyed talking about all sorts of things in life. And I said, do you mind if I just tell you what's been going on in my head? I, it's this experience I feel like I've had. She said, no, go ahead. So I did. I shared with her my entire near-death experience. And, and she started crying. And I said, why are you crying? She said, I don't want you to die. And I said, well, you're a nurse. This is a hospital. You deal with death all the time. She said, no, but you're magical. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And that's where I started to understand that what they say be, you know, is that if you weren't psychic before, you're psychic after. If you were psychic, you're more. I'm, I'm not going to uh, say that I'm psychic in any way, but empathy, the ability to connect with people and the ability to help people feel connected um, seemed to be my superpower, if you will, which is a wonderful thing. You know? And remember, I was told, pay attention to your relationships and everything is interconnected. So it's kind of like that was the blessing I was given. And I asked her, um, what does she mean by that? And she said, well, everybody here gets one doctor in the hospital, every patient. And they only get them for a few minutes a day because they're so busy. But for some reason, you have three to five doctors in here for an hour, hour and a half, and I walk by listening in, what are they talking about? It's about everything in but your medical record. However, one of these doctors wants you to be in business with him um, to the point that he has you on international conference calls and your legs up in a cage, you're doped up on pain medication, and, and yet <laughs> I guess you're making sense to them. And I would say after that, I've had other amazing in instances of uh, deep empathy, even to the point of not just feeling someone else's emotional landscape at that moment, but actually seeing it present in a way that made them look like a different person. And these are people the closest to me in this life. They literally appeared to change their face. And then they came back. And in all these cases, I realized in those moments, their energy state was very high, like uh, children going to a business party of my wife's. Um, Obviously, they have to be on their best behavior. It's like going, you know, doing acting. They have to really be on. It was my wife going to the premiere night of an opening play in which she had a role. Uh, and then they were also having to be people other than who they naturally are. The kids had to be grown-ups, and my wife had to be other characters. And it's like I was seeing this going on inside them, but manifesting as if they literally looked like different people. And I've had that happen several times. It's, it's kind of interesting, but I know what it is, and I'm just sitting there observing it. That kind of takes me to the other point of um, depersonalization. Uh, it's interesting, and I've talked to people about this. Sometimes when, I'll call it these impossible things are actually happening uh, right here in this world, it's amazing how people don't very often say, gosh, that's impossible. It's like we just accept it. Because if it's normal, if it's natural, we just sort of surf the wave. And I, I find that for me, that's that really was driven home because over on the side, I was depersonalized down to zero. Like I said, I, even though I'm looking at my future and you would think, okay, you can infer what your past is. It's like that wasn't the goal. The goal was to just feel for the pain and remove the pain. Um, that depersonalization was as if you had no, um, you didn't remember your individual personality. It's like, it would be so risky to say you had no ego, so I won't say that, but it's not like you had any attachment to anything. Um, it was just amazing. And like I said, you know, when you have the sine wave of joy, sorrow, joy, sorrow, you know, pursuing joy or trying to avoid sorrow, it's like instead being that main axis of acquiescence that flows in between, which neither pursues joy nor avoids sorrow, it simply accepts what comes. And that's been a, a huge adjustment. Um, one that has surprises, surprised people, it continues to surprise people, sometimes it consternates them, but, um, but you just sort of stay calm throughout so much. It's interesting that you say that. I've been thinking about this lately that, you know, you think about a ship and if your soul is the ship that's guiding you, then the physical world is all the waves that you're going to sail through. You know, some are great circumstances, others are quite painful. 
And when you look at humanity as a whole, humanity's gone through a lot and people are really shaken up these days, it seems, by very little. You know, we're not going through, you know, famines and, you know, uh, you know, horrific things in this country, but everyone is tossed around so badly. They're emotional. And I think that this reminder of your soul can carry you through the worst of things. I mean, like on a physical level, we near death experiencers are saying, man, you know, we went through it. You know, like we're warriors on some level to have walked again, eaten again, you know, like learn to be above that pain. And if we can do that, we can certainly get through a lot of, a lot more than, than we realize. It's so true. And, you know, the, what we're talking about is certainly, you know, recognizing some of the after effects of uh, having a near-death experience. You have physiological, psychological, uh, they talk about the electronic and the electrical, and I've certainly experienced all of that. So if someone ever asks, well, how do you know it's not a hallucination? You can point to the trash bin full of blown light bulbs or computers that don't work, cell phones that don't work. I mean, it's just, it's just been almost laughable. Uh, and predictable based on the statistics that are out there of, of how these things, how often these things happen. Um, but as we kind of move past that into the integration phase, that's the part I'm really interested in. Because to me, that's where you start to distill the wisdom from the experience. And this is what's going to be of greatest use to you. Not whether you can you know, like heal somebody that's sick, as nice as that is, that's not going to get you to heaven, so to speak. It's your transcendence from your understanding and your really becoming one with God or spirit, or whatever term you prefer. Um, and that's the part I'm, like I said, really focused on right now. And for me, that has sort of revealed different ways of understanding both this world that's around me and, and the next world. And I've been thinking a lot about uh, linear. Uh, information processing, you know, like you go to step A, you complete that, and now you go to step B. You know, we, we all understand how that works. But it's the nonlinear information processing, the nonlinear type thinking that I think is much more powerful. For instance, if you wanted to teach someone how to build a car, you might give them a box full of parts and a manual that says put A to B, B to C, that's linear. But if you could put on x ray glasses, and go over and watch an engine run and see all the parts inside and how they work together, that's a nonlinear approach to understanding how to build an engine because you're approaching it from how an engine works. You see the end state already, and now you can back that into where you are now. And what's subtly woven into that is the symbolism of how things work together. And for instance, think about it. In dreams, how often do you really remember having a conversation in a dream with people? I'm not saying we don't, but it's not as often as the symbolism of, the, of someone who walks into the room, say. And I kind of joke and say, you know, it's highly symbolic if you dream about taking a college exam you didn't study for and you suddenly look down, you're not wearing your pants. <laughs> You know, something crazy like that. Well, obviously, this is indicative of some stress or being prepared or being forgetful or things like that that might, you know, plague us on a daily basis. But it's, again, it's about that symbolism, and it's something we feel as well. And, and why do we so feel it or feel it so powerfully that our logic doesn't counter it and say, well, that can never happen? It's because logic does tell us what's correct and what should be, but our emotions tell us what's important. And that, that is key. That is key. We have to be clear about what's important to us. So I've been doing more thoughts on my own and, and also starting to do some research on linear versus nonlinear, as well as the power of symbols. And I think as we move from words to symbols, we realize an economy of motion, an economy of communication there, because you and I could both look at a very well-known symbol and it may mean two very different things for us. But the really cool thing about it is the story that's wrapped up in that symbol, you can unfold at your speed, I can unfold at my speed, and neither one of us is slowing the other down. Whereas if we both went in and sat and listened to a linear lecture, 
you might be an expert on that and realize only in the last sentence that, oh gosh, I didn't even have to come and hear this. And I'm thinking, wow, this is great. It's all new to me. You were only able to go at my speed, which was slow. <laughs> so, and I think beyond symbols comes vision. So I think it's like words, symbols, and vision. It's funny, I'm having a synchronicity and you saying this right now because I've been thinking about this and I think it's applicable to listeners. So a lot of people talk about manifestation or creating this life that you want. I think more than detailing it all out, creating a symbol gets you there quicker. So, you know, whatever that is that you want, you know, the picture, you know, a bright sun, you know, a, a beach or, you know, whatever it is, it gets you to that place and in life like you're talking about has all these ways of meeting you there and conforming to that. So I think it's a, a more profound way to manifest a future or to guide yourself toward a future. I agree. And I think too that so much is operating within natural laws. Like like for someone, they, a, a symbol for them that may be very simple is like if you were to take a Nautilus shell and cut it, it's a, a beautiful spiral. Well, that spiral obeys this mathematical formula called the Fibonacci series. Well, guess what? The Fibonacci series is the opening part of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I mean, wow. <laughs> Imagine choosing a symbol that is so inherently rich with information that is absolutely aligned with your path of unfolding. That would be very powerful. Very, very powerful. You're like looking in a mirror every day every step, every moment. So I think it's, I think it's really worth exploring that. And I, I think also, whether we're talking about our dreams or we're talking about our near-death experience, it seems that a lot of the communication that goes on over on the other side is highly symbolic. And that again makes sense because it's so rich and full of information, some of which we can only unpack here. It's like there you can be given this symbol. So you've been given the entire story. But you have to come back and through our artificial construct of time, open it up and let it play out at its own speed according to your own inclinations and your own destiny. I have a question about, you know, you said you were spiritual most of your life, and I'm just assuming, you know, that that's Christianity, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, but how did you look at the near-death experience and what you learned over there and how did it change or just enhance what you already know through your own spirituality? I, I will say I struggle with that. Um, honestly, uh, when I was little, I um, started realizing traditional Western uh, religion probably wasn't going to answer my burning questions. And I'll just be honest, there, there was a, an instance that God, I think, took me aside and said, I'm really glad you're asking a lot of questions about me. That's great. But, if you, but in that, I created man and man created religion. If you walk the ways of man, you may come out with more questions than you went in with. But if you walk with me, we're going to color outside the lines. We're going to go find truths where people say, don't go there and find truths. But it'll be you and me. And that has been my life. I mean, if I were to really detail, I've been on all seven continents, the Titanic, Mount Everest, the North Pole, a lot of different war zones. I've invented technologies. Uh, satellite communication technologies. I was a lecturer at Yale University School of Medicine. And each one of these things I've done, you, it's hard to see where they link to the thing I did just before. It's like a little quantum leap all along. I'm only sharing all that to just show you how this is how God calls outside the lines. You even get these opportunities in a way that people can't quite understand. It's not like it's unfair, you're being shown favoritism, it's just you happen to be in the right place at the right time and had the right key to the right lock. It's kind of like that. And I think in, in all cases, what was driving me was a sense of service. Like, where can I help? Or how can I make things better? And like I said, the behind the scenes at Disney World, wanting to make it a small world work better. Um, but so, Oh, gosh, over 20 years ago, uh, about 25 years ago, I found an Eastern path that really worked well for me. And on the day, I had to, make 20, I had to wait 20 years before they would let me in. That's how long. We're talking high school. That's when I started. I was made to wait 20 years before they let me in. And on the day I was let, let in or initiated, I said, why the wait? And they said, we don't seek to increase our numbers. 
I thought, man, that's really great. You know, I mean, that, that, that sounds like a path I could follow. You know, it's like, they don't need anything from me. They said, you can walk out the door and never need to acknowledge us. You know what you need to do now. Well, as great as this Eastern oriented path was, it was hard to reconcile a lot of the details. I would just say this. I have found a greater integration from a, let's go, I don't even know if I should call it a religious perspective, but I, restudying the Tao Te Ching. And again, I think, however, I will say this, I have gone back and, and read portions of the Bible, and I definitely feel differently about Jesus when I'm reading his words. I feel like I know him. I feel like I have a sense of who he is, like what he would be like in a room, what he would be like at dinner, what he'd be like walking down the road with. I, I get a sense of who he is and, and how he feels. And and of course, then you just want to read a bunch of different stuff, including uh, the Nag Hammadi Library and the Apocrypha. I mean, all these things, anywhere that it could possibly be an extra word that he spoke, you want to know that a bit more. Um, so full, full credit, I mean, and full recognition of uh, the validity of who he was and who he is. There is no was, <laughs> it is. Um, but that, um, I was just going to add to that, that um, I really, I really have enjoyed that process. It, but I was noticing something with the Tao Te Ching and that it, it, it like the in between, it speaks in enough ambiguity that I said, like I said, it makes you stretch, it makes you stretch to understand. And I know that's part of the process. Um, you, know, you can't accelerate the blooming of a rose. You have to just watch it unfold at its own speed. And it's a beautiful process. And that's how it is to assimilate and then express these spiritual truths we're given. Yeah, I resonate with a lot of what you've said. And it was many years after my near-death experience that I felt the spirit of Jesus in this cathedral. And I immediately understood who he was. You know, it was telepathic communication of just who he was. I, I feel the exact same way. Like, okay, I get it. And, and a lot of of what I try to incorporate in just being human, but be bringing the spiritual to the most human of situations is his energy. You know, that it really is that you can walk into any situation with any person struggling with anything and you don't come in with judgment, you come in with how do I elevate this person? How do I help them find their own grace and their own connection to healing? Exactly. And, and what's, the point that brings me to, and it's specifically perfect for you, is you are a teacher. And, you know, the word educate, the root of it means to draw forth. And the word educate was created in a time in which teachers believe that all truth and all beauty already exist within you. That your role as a teacher isn't to put something in. Your role as a teacher is to draw it out. And that's why the word is educate. Um, and that your job as a teacher was only to remind them of what they already knew. Now imagine waking up in a world like that, where everybody said, you already know it. I'm just here to remind you. And what res I mean, how much respect is already there for each other? You don't have to earn it. It's already there. I really like that concept. And so when, when I talk to people, I, I always try to talk to what I perceive to be the highest potential in that person. Meaning you're, you're through nuance, through your body language, through the choice of words you use, it becomes subtly, subtly obvious, if you will, uh, to them that you're, you're calling out the highest, that you're talking to them with high expectations. And, you know, for some people, for another person to talk to them in terms of their highest potential and to expect the best from them, they may walk away that day saying, this is the only person who's ever believed in me. Yeah. Wow. And that's it. And they may never see you again, and you may never see them again, but you will have lifted them up. And they will start to maybe see this higher sense of self, and they'll start to live according to it. So I want to go back before we end this conversation to what you were told in the in-between, because... Those statements are worth repeating and they're worth dissecting a little bit more, but I think you said something to the effect of we are all connected and if a choice causes too much pain, you know, then it needs to be removed, something to that effect. And 
grace happens when we're only given a few options. Could you explain more of how you've integrated those those statements or correct, you know, like my saying of them? <laughs> well, if they were to go to my website, um, they'll, they'll see this entire conversation there as well, uh, in, in between productions.com, in between productions.com. It's right there. But um, gosh, let me see. I'm just trying to remember. Um, well, let's see. All right, tell, just, let's start with one. Uh, wh which one is uh, top of your list? And you were removing choices that caused pain. And so there was, there was something that it was, you were told about that. And so. Um, okay. I know where you're at. I can talk about a little bit more. Sure. Uh, well, you know, what I said was, um, I said, you know, starting to look like if I don't have a bad future, then I have no future at all, as this mound of bad gears was growing. And I said, even though I now feel less pain, am I going to die sooner from doing all this? And it said, your destiny has to fit itself around futures that aren't meant to be. Your number of breaths are counted, but I will worry about your last one. And I said, you know, I don't know how comforting that is. And it said, eliminating bad choices doesn't mean you won't make wrong ones. You won't know they are wrong until after they pass. Since right and wrong are variables over which you have no control, the answers to what comes tomorrow are a waste. Better is understanding the beauty of how everything fits and refits together. And that's when I said, so what am I missing here in my lack of understanding? And I said, what is clearly before you, grace? No one deserves salvation. It can only be given by grace. It is your birthright. It must be chosen at the expense of the world that separates us. Is that touching on? Yeah, yeah. so that that idea of, so when I felt the grace and the salvation in my experience, I was kind of shocked by it. You know, like, oh, wow. But I didn't feel like I chose it in any way. I felt like it was just bestowed on me and maybe I didn't even deserve it or perhaps the people around me would have thought I didn't deserve it. Um, but then looking back, I'm like, why wouldn't I be given that grace? I was just a 22 year old kid who was trying to <laughs> the force. And see, yeah, it was your birthright. It, it is all of our birthrights. Uh, but again, you know, some of us may need to work a little harder to, to see that. And, and like you said, you know, being here is an answer to a prayer. And at some point in the soul's midnight, we have cried out and called God's name. And in the sincerity of that pain of separation, he called back our name. On that day, you're going home. <laughs> it's that simple. And you, you may wonder, what, how did this happen? Well, because you called. That's all I got. Interesting. So you feel like the near-death experience that you had was part of your soul's destiny and cry? I do. In fact, I have wondered for, you know, if we look at a lot of the near-death experiences that are out there, and if we broaden it out a little bit and look at the lives everyone has lived who had a near-death experience, <clears throat> I'm certain that looking at it from the outside, it might look like a random event. Like, wow, that, that was random. And, you know, you had this quantum leap and it's great after the fact, it's great you had it because you're so much a better person. But I really do wonder if we could see it from inside, their inner journey. I wonder if it would simply look like the next most natural step in their internal, personal, spiritual evolution. And I bet, I would say that's true in my case. And I would wonder for how many others who could maybe think introspectively, they might also agree. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know over time I've come to accept that it was part of my fate. So that I mean, my soul knew months beforehand that I was either going to die or, you know, I just thought I was going to die. You know, like I was pretty certain that that was my fate. And I even saw my tombstone read, you know, like dying at this age, because that's the only concept I had around death is like, you're done. I didn't really, I mean, I heard of near death experiences, but I didn't think that that's what was coming and for me and so it was a moment of grace but it was a deep understanding of how to live differently and how to involve myself in the world differently and yeah so it, i do understand that but 
fascinating talking with you. I'm glad we had this conversation. Thank you, Tricia. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I always enjoy talking about this and sharing it. And uh, it's great to see you again after the conference. <laughs> yes, yes. And you'll be in uh, Raleigh-Durham this next weekend. I know, yeah. Um, the IN's uh, chapter down in Durham is uh, bringing me in to talk to their group and share my experience. And uh, hopefully I'll get to hear about theirs as well. So it's not all one-sided. And uh, that will be Friday, the 21st of February, uh, 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Awesome. And I will be in Tucson on, uh, for those of you who are watching, might be in that area on Friday the 13th of March and then uh, Phoenix the next day. But yeah, we, we near death experiencers, we get around sometimes telling these stories. So true. <laughs> Very wonderful. But thank you for listening, everyone. And please check out the links to Jim Bruton's website and um, my upcoming events and changes as well to my website and so forth. But thank you for listening and may you be blessed.